Thanks for joining us for Fraud Talk. I'm Mandy Moody, social media specialist here at the ACFE. And his welcoming address to attendees at the 2012 ACFE Annual Fraud Conference in Orlando this past June, the ACFE's founder and chairman, Dr. Joseph T. Wells, predicted four fraud trends he expected to see in 2013. Identity fraud, healthcare fraud, international corruption, and cybercrime. In today's interview, we talked to ACFE faculty member Cynthia Hetherington, CFE and president of the Hetherington Group, about Dr. Wells' fourth prediction of an increase in cybercrime, specifically crimes and investigation involving social media networks. So what are some ways that you see online investigations evolving next year? In the, uh, in the coming year, we're, we're going to see a definite increase in online fraud. And I think the big, the big trend or the big item I'm looking at now is the hedge fund fraud. Because hedge funds in the past were able to solicit qualified individuals of a certain net worth to solicit them for, for investment money where now the uh, SEC is relaxing those laws, and now uh, a hedge fund could go to anybody. They can advertise on billboards if they wanted to and try to attract uh, investment money. With that said, I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities are going to come into play, and they're going to start doing what we call uh, crowdfunding. They're going to use crowdfunding, which, like right now in a post-hurricane environment, everyone's going and soliciting donations. You know, in the same vein, I think they're going to, they're going to use that same type of crowdfunding to go ahead and try to get communities to do mass investments. And um, I know that the NASAA is gearing up for this. All the different states' bureau of securities and securities groups are dealing are going to be dealing with this. And us as investigators need to be aware of what's going to be coming and, and how to deal with it and how to do our due diligence to you know verify where the legitimate requests are coming in versus the illegitimate ones. In the online world, we're going to see a continuation of the the same traditional uh, hacked accounts. As social networks in particular are getting, you know, quite beaten up right now, Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter are having issues with uh, actually overseas and and regionally specific areas of the world that are uh, have deliberate task force set up just to to break and enter into their to their profiles so that they can take over profiles. And, you know, I guess in a nutshell, I could say, if you sent me a friend request and I become your friend on Facebook, do I really know it's you or did your account get, you know, compromised and are you now going to start asking me to, you know, uh, send money, participate in games, do yeah. whatever else you could possibly imagine. So social, the, with more social networks coming on the horizon, more fraud is going to be attached to it. So what kinds of things do you see on social networks? What, what's the, how are those scams different from email? Really, they're not that much different except the trust factor. With email, we're, we're very well educated, you know, as a society that if we see a suspicious email, even from a friend with an attachment, you know, some sort of document enclosed to it, we tend to be hesitant before opening it up. I mean, it's pretty rare now that someone doesn't recognize what could be spam or a phishing attempt. But with, with the social networks, you got to keep in mind that when you're on a social network, you've really let your hair down. You're relaxed. You're in there to enjoy yourself, to communicate with your friends and family. So with your guard down, you're much more susceptible to taking, you know, accepting friend requests or, you know, adding these little applications to your profile, which is really nothing more than malware underneath. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of choice um, choice type of uh, corrupt uh, files and viruses that are out there that are getting passed through these networks. The On the plus side, because we are dealing on a platform, say, like LinkedIn or Facebook, you know, when they identify what the issue is, they can deal with it pretty quickly. But as the expression viral goes, as soon as it gets on there, it really does spread quite quite fast. When, when we teach our classes, and just as you know, when you're in front of individuals and you're asking them, do you have Facebook, do you have LinkedIn, and they're telling you no, that's the first step. They have to get some sort of a, account or presence on, on social networks so that they understand what they're dealing with. This would be like, you know, taking a cost accounting class without ever, you know, having used a, a 
calculator before. I mean, you really can't just jump in the middle and say, okay, I'm going to do an investigation with this tool. So they should start now when it's not a major issue. Mm-hmm. Learn and understand Facebook. I mean, even the you know the most obvious ones, the Facebooks, Twitters, Pin interests. You know, they should understand what they are, what they're doing, and what the potential is, so that they can identify when there is an issue or not. And um, what they might not realize is that how many cases get solved because of very easily obtainable information on people's open profiles. You know, if they took some time to use the computers and look for it, they would you know potentially save, you know, thousands of dollars doing, you know, the old gumshoe work versus this. Really nothing gets you started like just sitting down, opening up an account, and, you know, trying to figure out what, what's all the talk about. Mm-hmm. Taking the plunge. Mm-hmm. Definitely getting into it. And it's, you know, it seems silly you ask a, you know, 62-year-old business executive to sit down and start, you know, catching up with his old buddies from high school or college, but, you know, you'll find it's, it's not that, you know, terrible after all. What's one of the stories that you tell people of, of how it's worked, um, the, the information you can find on, on, you know, like Facebook? We, we had, I just got an email in the other day from a fellow I, I taught in class in 2009, and he wrote me to thank me. He said he had found his daughter who was abducted 18 years ago by her mother after she she was only six months old, so non-custodial abduction, abducted and took off with her. And he used the, the, the sources that we talked about in class, which are mostly free resources and open sources. You know, they're not trying to break into someone's Facebook account. He just learned how to use Facebook, started doing searches for girls about a certain age, you know, in a certain area and certain looks and all the other things. And he located his daughter, and he wrote me to thank me that, um, you know, what we learned in class was actually... I mean, we we use these all the time professionally, and I'll give you an example there too. But how this was personally, you know, wow. gratifying. I know it was a great it was a great email to get. People are like, oh, I can't keep up with this. It's you know, it's changing all the time. Why should I bother learning? The methodology for how you search in these social networks stays the same. That doesn't change. There's a new social network coming out every other day, but how you search them doesn't change. So once you learn the how to, you could just mm-hmm. apply it for years. And, and you'll be, you know, right on target with it. We had um, we had a company that we were doing an investigation on. Uh, it was a Ponzi scheme. And we were trying to find the connection between a, a couple of associates involved in a Ponzi scheme. And at this point, the Ponzi schemers were all in jail. You know, the case is closed. We're working on the, the aftermath, you know, where all the banks are suing, all of the lawyers are suing, and everyone's going after it. So we just need to put people together. Using using our search techniques, you know, good search mm-hmm. techniques, we located one subject on LinkedIn. We found out all the people that he was connected to, and we realized right there where he was connected to, he was um, associated to uh, one of the other parties we needed to connect him to. We looked that fellow up, and we looked up his Facebook account, and we found the three other people we needed. They're all buddies, like fishing trip type buddies. So um, golf wow. buddies, that type of thing. But, yeah, so actually with the combination of their personal and professional social networks, we were able to pull all these individuals together and say, you know, they've had a long-standing relationship and, you know, there's definitely a conflict of interest. And, it, you know, it it actually goes towards the anti-money laundering issue mm-hmm. because we think that they relax their money laundering um, uh, pr- protocol when it came, you know, time to start looking at this one guy's friend's uh, company. So definitely, definitely worked wonderfully there as well. Wow, and that's just, I mean, that is just by seeing their connections. Well, and just seeing their connections. And here's the crazy thing. When you really look at it, maybe a, you know, a few thousand dollars on an investigator to, to look up this information makes millions on their cases. Yeah. I mean, our, our few hours, you know, our couple mouse clicks for us is huge in a major investigation like that. And we never had this before, so why not take advantage of it now? It really is the most useful, current, trending source that we have today is wow. social networks. I guess you already answered this, but what trend do you most expect to see? Yeah, I'm, I'm putting my money on hedge funds right now because I just think that there's going to be a lot of improper advertising going out there. And, and not from legit. I mean, there's legitimate hedge funds who can now maybe open up their 
their purview of who their clients might collectively be in the future. But there's just going to be copycats as well who are, you know, going to create some sort of either Ponzi schemes or false funds, and they're going to start using social media to reach us and to, and to take advantage. What you're also going to see, I think the other half of the trend is, <laughs> maybe it's just me in my post-hurricane stage right now, but, you know, the weather seems to be getting harder for everyone every year. There it seems to be a catastrophe constantly happening somewhere in the world. Mm-hmm. And the you know the people who are raising funds through social networks are you know going hey let's let's all put our money behind you know the the post Katrina or the Haiti or the tsunamis in Japan you know there's a lot of fraud there people are collecting money and they're not doing anything with it yeah I've already seen news stories about Sandy fraud uh, absolutely Sandy fraud charity fraud is huge it's a great way to hide your money and not get taxed on it at the same time. So what are some, what are, you know, maybe two or three red flags? Okay, uh, first one, that the first red flag you want to look for is they're not registered with the federal government. They don't have a federal employee identification number. You know, they're not a legitimate company, and a very easy way to check for that is to check with the Secretary of State that they claim to be in. Because to be a nonprofit, you have to also be incorporated. So, if, yeah. you know, Mandy Moore wants to create a nonprofit for Sandy, you know, you actually have to go and register with Texas and tell them, you know, what you're doing. And then you apply for a nonprofit status with the IRS. This, this stuff takes time and, and energy. You know, you can't just whip together a nonprofit in a day. Uh, that would be my first flag. My second flag is that they're, they're pressuring you for donations. Most of the reputable groups like the Red Cross, United Way, and, and uh, institutions we're very familiar with, you know, will make requests, but nobody will pressure you. And, of course, the big one is, you know, when they start asking you for funds and, you know, just write a check out to this particular fellow. He's the one who needs the money. I mean, it's one thing to know a friend or have a neighbor and say, look, let me help you out and give him a couple bucks. Another thing, when a stranger comes up to you and says, would you mind writing a check out to this guy? Yeah. It would be a big big flag right there. If you had to tell, you know, companies or CFEs working for companies skills or investigative methods that they, they're just going to have to have going into 2013. You have to know and understand what the laws are that govern your online investigations. So that's, that's actually the most important thing I should mention. You should know what laws govern them. Very few laws are actually out and in place, but there are some very important ones. For example, if we were doing pre-employment checks, we couldn't be looking at their social networks because, you know, that will tell me how tall, how old, you know, certain things that I can be in violation of the EEOC. That said, once you understand, okay, I'm, you know, free and permitted to go ahead and look up this guy because I'm doing, say, an internal investigation, which is different from hiring practices, then what are the policies that are going to govern my office. If your company has no policy about social networks and behavior that's on social networks or no behavioral-like policy whatsoever, you know, for example, if you're going to go to a conference, you know, outside of ACFE and you're representing the ACFE, uh, you know, you're not going to be getting reckless that night because you know mm -hmm. that you could potentially lose your job because, you know, you've signed documents that say I'll always be, you know, professional when I represent my company. The same holds true for social networks. So you can't go home and start complaining about the bosses and and uh, and the coworkers and and openly talking about what's out there. So once we're clear on what the law is and what the policy is, then you absolutely are going to start using social network investigations within your cases. You're going to join them together with the public records that are available. You know, providing we're in the United States, very available outside the United States, maybe not so much. And uh, you're going to keep a very open mind. What you find maybe in someone's Facebook account or LinkedIn might not necessarily be as truthful or might be a gross exaggeration. But you don't want to make all of your opinions based on something you've read on the Internet. So that final bit, you know, public records, public information, and then you meet and you, you do your interview, I think you should be, you know, pretty secure in what kind of uh, fraud investigation you could do at that point. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Fraud Talk. We hope your 2012 wraps up well, and we look forward to you joining us in the new year. To find more information about Cynthia's courses offered by the ACFE, visit acfe.com training.